Yes, indeed, it is a real pleasure to, uh, to talk to you about this painting. I always enjoy talking about it. My name is Matthias Wivel. I am the curator of 16th century Italian paintings here at the gallery. So this is one of the pieces in my care at the moment. It is Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne, and it depicts a moment described in, in classical poetry. I'll return to that. It is the moment where, uh, when Ariadne and Bacchus meet. Ariadne is the daughter of King Minos, and she helps Theseus defeat the Minotaur and extract him from the labyrinth where the Minotaur is on Crete. And then they go off together, a, a couple. But immediately, Theseus, fickle as he is, goes off and abandons her. And you can see that in the picture. Out in the far left, you can see his ship leaving the shore. Ariadne is, is left behind, and she is distraught, at least according to Ovid. According to Catullus, who is the other main source of this, she's furious. So it's up to you to see, to, to perhaps uh, interpret the emotions going through her in the painting and what Titian, Titian looked at both sources. In any case, she's been abandoned. And then suddenly she hears behind her noise, symbols, uh, shouts, yells, song, and turns and sees Bacchus, the god of, god of wine. He's returning from India where he has had a triumphant visit and is coming back with a retinue of revelers and partiers, satires, drunken uh, maniacs, and so on and so forth. They're all depicted here. And at that moment, they see each other and fall in love. And it's just beautifully depicted by Titian, the way that she turns like a ballet dancer to face Bacchus. And the, her turn is accentuated by this red scarf wraps around her. And he, on his chariot, pulled by two cheetahs, jumps unselfconsciously from the chariot to her. It's a jump, it's a slightly awkward jump. He is, he is uh, so taken with her that he forgets himself. And it, it, that's beautifully depicted. This, he's suspended in midair in a slightly hazardous leap from the, uh, from the chariot. And their eyes meet. This is the moment when their eyes meet. And I think this is, it's the greatest depiction of love at first sight that I know of. It, it's, it's really, it really captures the, the magic of, of a moment like that. So that's, that's the, the moment that the Titian is going for. Obviously, there's a lot more going on. I will just quickly suggest the, the, the following, the, this, what happens after this, and Titian does this. This is always the challenge when you do a narrative painting. In one image, you have to capture a story. And Titian here is doing a very literary painting. He is referring to stories told by classical poets. And so he suggests the before by having Theseus leave uh, out on the far left, and he suggests the after by the constellation up there. That's the Corona Borealis, uh, the, the constellation. And it consists of eight stars. It, it, it differs in the sources. But what happens is that because she's a mortal and she engages with a with an immortal, a god, obviously at some point she's going to die. I mean, that's what happens. That's inevitably what, ha what happens if you engage with the gods and, and, and in general. And uh, some, some of the sources has, her, has him transforming her into this constellation to perpetuate her in the sky. It's as a sign of their love. Others have, uh, has it that it's her wedding wreath, the, the wreath she wears when she uh, when she weds Bacchus, that he throws into the sky and it turns into these stars. A little background on the painting. It was painted for uh, Duke Alfonso d'Este of Ferrara between roughly 1520 and 1523. It was delivered to Ferrara in 1523. Titian was a Venetian painter and worked in Venice, but visited Ferrara for this very prestigious commission. It was a commission that consisted of a series of paintings that uh, Duke Alfonso had originally commissioned from other artists, the greatest artists of the time. Giovanni Bellini, Titian's uh, possible teacher, or at least his, his immediate, in the, his, the, the greatest inspiration in his early career. And that was the only Venetian painter. Then the other painters that he'd commissioned from were Florentine. It was 
it was, uh, they were, well, Central Italian. It was Raphael, Michelangelo, and Fra Bartolomeo. So really a, 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 a murderous row of the greatest artists at the time. Now, uh, what happened was that Fra Bartolomeo died, didn't finish his paint, did, did, only did some sketches. Uh, Raphael died in 1520, also didn't do anything. He had also done a sketch, but didn't go anywhere. And Michelangelo, as usual, didn't, didn't deliver. Uh, Michelangelo sometimes delivered, but a lot often didn't. And in this case, he didn't. And there was a, um, a, a long uh, correspondence dealing with, 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 between the Duke and Michelangelo, but it, it never worked out. So actually, Titian ended up taking over the whole, or almost most of the commission. There was a court painter at Ferrara who, who probably did, or did one of the pictures, Dosso Dossi, did one of the, the, it's a lost picture, we don't have it anymore. But the other pictures, there's the Bellini Feast of the Gods, it is in the National Gallery of Washington, and it was later retouched by Titian to bring it up to, uh, to sort of update its style to fit with the other paintings. Then it's the, it's the Feast of Venus and the uh, Bacchanal of the Andrians, both in the Prado, and then it's this. So those are the, the, the pictures that were part of this cycle. They were meant for a small room that Alfonso had set up for himself, sort of a room where he could retire to contemplate or to just enjoy himself. It's a small room for just enjoyment, for a camerino, as is described in the sources, uh, and with, with beautiful objects where he could, he could retire. So it's meant for quite an intimate setting, actually probably a room smaller than the one we're in now. Not much smaller, but somewhat smaller. And that is, we try to approximate this, the, the general, that general sense of intimacy, but also slight, quite grand scale of, of the, uh, of, in implicated by, or sort of indicated by the, by the painting here. <clears throat> so that, that's, the, that's the context of the commission. This is Titian. So Titian is if, if ever uh, very, very um, focused on, or very intent on, on outdoing his peers. And he was always painting in competition with somebody. And here he got his chance. He was still a fairly, I mean, he had had his popular breakthrough in, in Venice. He was, a, by this, by this time, he was quite famous, but he was still fairly young and very, very ambitious. And this was his chance to compete with the greatest artist of the time. Not only Bellini, his senior in Venetian painting, uh, but also Fra Bartolomeo, Raphael, and Michelangelo. And he, really, this is Titian trying as hard as you'll ever see him do. Uh, it is immensely detailed. Everything is rendered with, with, with great intention and, and, and real, attention to, to, to detail and to, to really to make, make the story come to life. The inspiration from Raphael can be seen very much in the, in the, in the, in the main figure uh, of Bacchus, which is really quite unprecedented. I mean, even though he's looking at Raphael, he's doing something that Raphael would never have done here. Raphael painted in the, in the, in the, um, the papal apartments, the stanza in the Vatican, he painted the expulsion of Heliodorus with an angel uh, suspended in, mid, in midair, flying, of course, as angels do, uh, and this is, that's as close to a precedent as we get than this, but Raphael's figure is, is, is elegant, it's an angel, it's an angel ex expelling a, a heathen from the, from the temple in Jerusalem. Here, uh, as always with Titian, the figure expresses the inner life of, of uh, and, and the story, and, and it, he, is, he is suspending a, a figure in, in midair, but as I said, it's a figure who, <laughs> is maybe gonna land very uncomfortably uh, because he's thinking of something else. And it, it's just, it's wonderful. I mean, you can almost feel the breath running through his body. You can, you can feel some, the acceleration of these two figures, her too. I mean, it's, it's just, it's always, always with Titian done with great, great attention to, to the inner life of, of his characters. So, so that's, uh, in a sense, the, 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 the Raphael inspiration. Um, he's also trying to, what, what, which something which, of course, uh, was very important to artists at the time, art artists who really wanted to be uh, on the forefront of what, what they were doing to integrate classical sources, both uh, literary sources, as Titian is doing here, and visual sources. And I mean, that is one of the, the hallmarks of what we understand as the Renaissance, is the, is the up updating of classical form to a modern idiom. And, and this, this painting in many ways does resemble a, a Roman relief. It's, it's organized very much like a relief with, with movement from right to left. 
and then of course with the, with the bookend of, of Ariadne turning and, and, so, and dynamizing the other, other end of the, of the painting. But, but that it, it is this sort of freeze-like composition, but with very uh, three-dimensionally rendered figures. And that is, of course, something that Michelangelo was, was uh, great at and something that Antitian was very aware of Michael, what Michelangelo was doing. Uh, most uh, importantly, in terms of antique sources here, is, the, is this, this figure with, with snakes um, <coughs> uh, rung around him there. Uh, he's based on the Laocoon, the famous, famous Laocoon, who, which had been unearthed in Rome in 1506 and was a sensational discovery because it's described in ancient sources and here it was, this famous sculpture uh, that everybody had read about but nobody had seen and suddenly it was there. And it's Laocoon and his sons being killed by snakes. I'm sure you uh, will have seen it. And the, this is an adaptation. It's not, it's not a copy after the Laocoon, but the arm is very, very close to, to the, the, the statue in the, in the Vatican. So Titian is showing his erudition, uh, and then he's also showing just his, his uh, abilities as a painter. And that, the latter really comes, comes out in, in, in the variety of detail and the attention to detail. The, um, one thing that, that most people notice immediately, and it's one of my favorite parts, of course, are the cheetahs. I mean, they're so, li they're so lively, they're so true to life, and surely not based on, as, as one would often, it's an exotic animal that obviously you wouldn't find in Italy normally, and uh, when, often when you're doing exotic animals, people would refer to, to, other, to, to model books or other drawings by other people uh, of these kinds of exotic animals, but these are so realistic that they must be based on a real animal, and the theory is that Alfonso had a cheetah in his menagerie in, in, at Ferrara. He had a little zoo. Um, we know he had animals like, like that. We didn't know, don't know for sure that he had cheetahs. But also, uh, in Ovid, it's described as tigers. And as the, no, the cheetahs are not described. So it could also be, you know, he, that's the cat he had available, in the, in this fascinating animal. Of course, Bacchus is associated with the leopard. You often, often see Bacchus with a leopard skin. So it could also be. Um, an awareness of that association that we have here, but it's a, it's a cheetah, not a leopard. Anyway, that's, that's a discussion one could have, but, but he is, he is uh, associated with that. Other uh, wonderful details in the, uh, in the picture is, I mean, it's just, it's just a sense of, the, the sense of play, the, sen the sense of abandon, that these figures, we have Silenus here sleeping on his, uh, on, on a, another very realistically rendered uh, a donkey, and he's sleeping, and he's gotta fall off, because he's so drunk, this fat, uh, reveler here. Um, <clears throat> we have these wonderful ladies with their, with their garments uh, blown by the wind and suggesting their movement, the dancing movements. We have the little satire here in front dragging a heifer's head. And it, there's something, also something unpleasant about it. I mean, the, the, it, it does suggest the abandonment of, of, um, of that, that Bacchus is impersonates. I mean, he's the god of wine. He's a, he's, he is what happens when you lose control in a way, when you consciously lose control. And, when you drink, when you party, when you, yeah. You know. um, so, so there's a there's a there's a, a slightly disturbing undercurrent. I mean, this dismembered animal. It's uh, right there. And there's a little lapdog um, uh, barking at him, and he doesn't he doesn't notice at all. And that dog probably it's a uh, examinations of the pictures of the picture reveal that it's a late addition to the painting. And one imagines that it might actually be Alfonso's dog that he wanted included in the picture. Uh, another late addition is this yellow, this beautiful lemon yellow uh, piece of cloth down here on which, on which this, this uh, vessel uh, lies, this bronze vessel which t with, with Titian's signature on it. Beautifully arranged with his signature, um, uh, accentuated by, by the fact that it's on this yellow piece of cloth. And that yellow piece of cloth is also late addition, and I think it's something that Titian adds to give a, a, another accent there. To, if it weren't there, it would maybe be a little um, would be a dull area of the picture. And he really doesn't want this picture to be dull. I mean, everything has to be uh, at a maximum uh, if, if level of interest. Uh, beautiful flowers. Uh, we have iris, we have columbine, and we have a capers, uh, caper flower down there. And they're <coughs> rendered with botanical detail, it's something that Titian didn't generally do. It's, it's, it's quite unusual for, for him to be that, that naturalistic in his rendering of plants. I mean, he, he did it to an extent at the, at, in this period, but later on he would be more expressive and, and more suggestive in, in his rendering of, of such details. And this probably is Titian 
being aware of northern painting, and especially Albrecht Dürer, who had visited Venice, I mean, 20 years before, but left an incredible, incredibly strong impression on Venetian artists, and obviously had brought uh, his, the, the, all these famous drawings he did of, of, uh, of plants, which are just, you know, the great piece of turf, turf in the Albertina is the most famous. It's a piece of grass, but it's, it's wonderfully, wonderfully uh, evocative and, and, and detailed and, and, and very clear in its, in its um, visual uh, registration of, of, what it, of what it shows. And I think Titian is also competing with Dürer here, if, as if Michelangelo, Raphael, and Fra Bartolomeo weren't enough. Uh, <coughs> Something, I should maybe say a little bit more about the sources because this is, of, Titian was not, did not read Latin and uh, would probably not have come up with, with this on his own in a, in a sense. He probably, I mean, he, he was friendly with humanists uh, in Venice and in, and in Byron's, a lot of very, very erudite, learned people it, that he knew and, and it, surely uh, the, the scheme of this room, which is all based on classical sources, this is the only one that's based on a, uh, on, on a, a narrative. The others are based on re, uh, recreations of, of paintings described by Philostratus, like paintings that existed in antiquity that we no longer know, that uh, are described and then that Titian then recreated for Alfonso. And this is probably done, uh, the scheme is probably devised by a humanist uh, at the court of Ferrara, uh, in dialogue with Titian, and Titian reads the sources in translation and then decides what to do. Uh, but it, it's very, li very uh, lit literary painting in a way, but it's at the same, at same time, as I said earlier, gloriously visual and sensual. And I think the sensuality also really comes out in the description, I mean, the landscape is just, I mean, this is one of Titian's great, great specialties and what he really, one of his great contributions to, to painting is a way he can just do a, an evocative landscape that makes you want to, you know, float into it. And, and if you walk up uh, close to the painting afterwards, do look at this part of the painting here, the landscape that you see here. It's so beautifully, it's very, very well uh, preserved. That's one of the best preserved parts of the painting. And you can just, it's, it's, it's tactile and, and one of the, the shifting light from the sun shooting across the, these, these green fields here. It's, it's, it's really very, uh, very exquisitely done and Titian at his best. And then of course, receding towards this blue uh, the, the, the blue haze in the horizon. And actually, this, one interesting thing uh, is that this painting and this series of paintings was Titian's first great engagement with mythological subject matter. And famously, he, his other great, I mean, there are several, but uh, two main ones. This is the first project, and then in the 1550s and to, through the early 60s, he painted the famous mythologies for Philip II, the king of Spain, who in the latter part of his career was his most important patron. And we have two, maybe three of them, uh, at least we have three mythologies of that period in uh, room six, uh, just on the other side of the Holbeins. As you know, very f these very famous paintings that were painted in the 1550s, same format. And I think Titian, at that point, he was given carte blanche to do a series of mythological paintings for Philip of Spain uh, he, he, had to, he chose the subject matter himself, probably in consultation with literary friends, possibly, um, but it was not stipulated by Philip. And Titian chose the same format. And he did not have a particular space in mind. He, he was thinking of a space, but he did not have a particular space in mind. But he had found, I think, at, this, at the time in the 15 teens and 20s when he worked, on, worked in Ferrara, that this was a format that suited him and that worked well for the kind of painting that Philip wanted. And therefore, when you go and see the, the, the Diana and Acton, the Diane and Callisto and the death of action, you'll see them, they're approximately the same format. And another thing which is so interesting about it is that here we have Titian at his, at his most uh, detailed, his most, the most meticulously rendered type of painting from him. Uh, and in those paintings, it's his famous later style where he opened up his brush strokes and, and, and had colors merge on the, on the painting in, in a, in a <coughs> into a totality that's, that's often more suggestive than it's than it's specific. But actually, when you see the landscape here and you compare the landscape, in the, especially the, the Diana and Acton, you'll see that there's real continuity. It's the same basic procedure. He paints it in the same way and it's the same. It's very similar. It's 30 years, almost 30 years later, 25 years later or something. Um, and 
it's, it's very, very similar. There's a logical progression. Even though one tends to regard late Titian as quite radical, uh, it's, not a, it's not radical in terms of his own development. It's, it's actually quite logical. And, and I think th the privilege of being able to see this with those pictures in, in, this, in the same series of rooms is, is quite wonderful. <clears throat> what else is there to say? I think I will leave you with, 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 with those observations and then just uh, once again encourage you to look at the two protagonists. I mean, it really is, it's, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful moment captured. It's, it's one of these moments that just that, that burns into your, your mind. I mean, it's, it is so originally conceived. It, it looks like, not quite like anything else. I mean, people have been chasing for prototypes, and as I, I mentioned Raphael. There's also a Roman sarcophagus. There's always a Roman sarcophagus when you t talk about re uh, Renaissance paintings. There's always a Roman sarcophagus with a figure that's vaguely like it. But, but it's perfectly conceived. Even if he's gotten it from a Roman sarcophagus, uh, it's perfect, this, this figure, this, this wonderful figure, it's perfectly conceived for pat the, the particular story he wants to tell and for the emotions he wants to uh, elicit in, in, in the viewer, the, what he wants us to think about. So that, that moment is, 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 is one to, to savor and one to remember. Thank you.